would you just would you just show me where you need to be first and how so that I can give you the place that you want and desire so that everything else will just sort of come into uh, the best quality and the best thing that you have in store for me. And last week, we started off this year because I feel like it's important and imperative. You know, there's, there's things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to really map out and, and, and how God wants to be able to build a strategy for your life and putting some of those things down. But I felt like it was important for us to kind of look at first uh, a really a heart and in, in, in obviously the character and nature of Solomon for us to take a look at one of the, the wealthiest, one of the most successful people who really was considered obviously by many, probably the richest person that ever lived. And I felt like you guys would think that would be cool. So I thought, you know, let me throw that at you just to sort of put a carrot in front of you. Just joking. But we looked at last week, really, that Solomon did something incredible at the age of 12 years old, right? And he prayed a pretty audacious, incredible prayer that led him into everything that God had in store. He never prayed, God, let me, let me be the coolest, the richest, the, 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 the biggest, the baddest. He actually asked God for wisdom and understanding, Woo, right? W and U, woo. And, uh, and I believe that for this year, that that's what God wants to do in our lives as we set out to seek his very best, as we set out to sort of push aside from immaturity and the fact that maybe God's spoken words like, like I had uh, heard over my son where God's gonna do great stuff with you. It's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be awesome. But because you weren't ready for it, because when the word came, when you heard it, you were still a little immature and you were like ninja blue, ninja swords. That's your response, so to speak, and sort of did your own thing. But I think in 2013, God's aligning our hearts to something really big and awesome. And he's been laying a foundation in E3 Church for many years about God's goodness, God's favor, God's love, the reality that God likes us, the reality that God has great plans for us to change our thinking, to change how we've focused because he wants to do something incredible. And we can't get there if the foundation hasn't been laid and we don't know that we're valuable to God. That is first and foremost. Think about where the church could be right now if the church at large had a grasp on the reality that they were valuable to God and they started to walk in the confidence that God liked them, God was with them, God was fun and exciting and had a great personality and wanted to be able to invade every space in their life. Not religion God, not weird somber Jesus, not, you know what I'm talking about, but really a God of life who came to give us the best possible life. And some of us, we've laid a foundation for a long time because we haven't trusted that God was good that way. We haven't trusted church. We haven't trusted uh, religion because we've, we've been abused and we've been hurt. And I believe the time has come for us to move past the hurts, even in my own life, to move past some of the places where I've been disappointed, where I've been let down, where I thought, you know, th that, that thing was going to be awesome, and then I got exposed to it, and I was like, eh, you know what I'm talking about? You get to know someone, you think they're going to be great, and then it's like, ah. Oh. But I believe that God is doing something new. And, and it's not okay if you saw me today and I had this huge scab on my, on my, my uh, arm here and you were like, what happened? And I was like, well, uh, 15 years ago, I fell off my, my skateboard and got cut. You'd be like, 15 years ago, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and some of us, we live because we've been hurt and, and that hurt is that way. We, we've been hurt in, in churches We've been hurt by Christians. We've been hurt by ideas. We've been hurt living out of some of the experiences because of the pain of our past. But I believe that God is encouraging us with his heart of love and his desire to see the very best for us to say, okay, it's time. It's time. It's time. I, I know I know somebody, somebody did something to you, but it's time to start putting me first and foremost. I know you sort of pushed that to the side, and I know that I've, I've let you sort of experience all the other things, and, and you've done those things, and you've ran with, and you've, you've tried your hand at this, but I think he's really saying it's this, this season, this year, that I want your heart to be in alignment with my heart. I want you to start to step out, because you know now I can be trusted. I want you to put me first. I want you to put me first in every area. 
And, and this, is not, this is not just a, a thought. I mean, the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's what, that's what Solomon said, that the beginning of wisdom is to be in awe of him. Not, not, not cowering, but in awe. And, and I think that that is important. The first step in our relationship with God is that awe, right? I mean, when I, when I came to know God, who he was and his love for me, I was in awe. And there would be moments where it broke me down because I didn't think it was that good because I had been in a structure and I had lived out of the pain of my past. And once again, not on my notes here, but whatever. Um, I lived out of the pain of the past. And so I took that into my relationship with God. And instead of, of tr- seeking to know him and to be with him, I sought to uh, perform for him like a circus act. Anybody do that? And, and I sought to try to do all the things and, and I had come out of a pretty <clears throat> uh, rough background in the sense I did some things that weren't so great. Um, I always say my wife had more of a straight and narrow, and I had more of a windy path. Any windy path people out there? Thank you. Two, two of us that admit it. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. Appreciate that. Um, and so that windy path, and so, you know, when, when I got a, a, an awareness and I came into the, the atmosphere of church, I wanted to be better. I wanted to do better. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you'd been guilty. You'd felt bad about some of your choices. I did. But unfortunately, I grabbed a hold of that information, and I took that information, and I tried to, to, to be better. I tried to just to, to make all the, uh, the actions and activities, and you would have thought I was a circus clown because I was doing all that stuff. But really, the Bible doesn't tell us that it is the behavior that God's after, changing your behavior. Anybody been to a place where they communicated to you and you felt a very strong sense of change your behavior? You are dirty and nasty, and in order for God to like you, you need to change your behavior. It's contrary to what his word says. But he does tell us that the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom, supernatural insight into the affairs of life is a definition of wisdom. The beginning of it is to be in awe of God. And this morning, one of the areas and places that I think we're going to see flows a lot of wisdom and understanding has to do with this general area of our face, okay? And so this morning, uh, I want to hone in, focus in on what I will title Train the tongue, okay? Uh, train the tongue. There's a, there's a lot that the Bible has to say about our words. Um, there's a lot that it has to, to say about the power of the tongue, right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I just kind of feel like that's pretty potent scripture. We might want to take some time to kind of figure out exactly what does that mean. And, and most of us, you know, we have lived out of the uh, byproduct or the fruit of our mouth. And, and what we have said, what we have discussed, how we have spoken of certain things has really created, I mean, the Bible says that God, he framed the worlds with his words. And they're an important thing. I mean, they're, they are containers of life. And I feel like we want to just hone in on it just a tad bit this morning because it sort of takes us into uh, this whole concept for the beginning of the year of wisdom. Alrighty? Let's start off with a passage of Scripture. Proverbs 21 and 23, obviously coming from Solomon. He says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Now, I I don't know if any of you go through any regimen or have, but we'll, we'll break it down like this. When I was in high school, um, I used to play basketball. Maybe shocking to some of you, but I did. And during that time, we would always do specific drills. I'm sure those of you who played sports, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, uh, and, and we had a, a whole host, especially for defensive drills, where we had to consistently move our feet. And so we'd throw the ball out, we'd run up, and then I'd just have to move my feet, and I'd have to go left, excuse me, left and then right. I know my, I know my right and left. And uh, so there was consistent drills. And part of, part of uh, those drills um, had to do with, with getting to know the person that you were guarding. 
And so I, I had to always run up and, and put my hands in, in the offensive person's face, and I had to consistently keep my hands kind of in movement to, to block passing lanes. All right, you can stay with me. And, and then when a shot went up, I, I would actually have to reach out behind me either to, to box out. But at, at any given moment, I was responsible to know where the other player was so that I would be able to be uh, successful in what I was doing. Now, God tells us in the same way that his, t- his desire for us is that we would train our tongue in, in, the, in the same manner, in the same way, because if, if we do, if we would, in the same way that, that I would guard somebody, God's desire is that we would guard our tongue because it is one of those things that gets us into trouble. Have you, have you ever, has you ever had that experience? Okay, don't need to elaborate anymore. Um, let's, let's read a couple more passages because I, I feel like you're just, you're just sitting there. You are, you are just sitting there, aren't you? Okay. James 1.26 says, If anyone among you thinks he's religious or he's serving God and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion or service of God is useful. Appreciate that. Thank you, James, on that one. Proverbs 29. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So we're laying a foundation here in the power of the, of, of the thing that God has given to us, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, that God's desire is for us to guard it in such a way because if we don't, it brings trouble. And he says that, in fact, your, your words, they can become like sword thrusts. I know none of you have ever used words in that fashion, but other people outside of this building, they've used words, but on the opposite side of that, it's truth as well, that the tongue of the wise brings healing. And I I don't know about you, but for me, I want to be a person who's seeking after wisdom. You with me? And so we're going to look at how to just, how to do that, and I've come up with a, a very fancy acronym on the word TRAIN. Okay, so how to train the tongue. The first thing that the Bible tells us in James 1.19, it says, So then, let my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So he says, I want you to first and foremost, the T, is to time out. Before, before you jump into a conversation, before you respond to anything specifically, I want you to just take a time out, all right? And I want you to weigh your words. I mean, think about how much pain has been caused, spouses, by you not heeding those words. How many times have you emotionally responded quickly in a situation because you just felt like it and you just decided to give a person a piece of your mind? And how many of you, there was a tree of life and healing, right? How many, how many of you know it might have behooved you in your foibles, <laughs> might have behooved you to have just taken a moment to slow yourself? Now, God gives us wisdom, right, and understanding. He, he says, I want you to just be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Someone uh, said, just wait, and their definition was why am I talking? <laughs> Just wait. Why am I talking right now? There's, there is the propensity for most of us in any conversation to show off what we know. There, there, there is so many times in certain situations we just want to be heard and we just want somebody to hear what we have to say. So we chime in and we give our two cents and really that's all it's worth. And God says, I want you to be slow. Be a person. And this, this is for me, this is for you. I feel like this year that God's saying in, in situations, I want you to be slow to speak. I want you to just hold up for just a second. Because the fruit of it will be a blessing to you. It'll bring healing to your relationships. It'll actually bring benefits to your friendships. And I know people like this. I mean, mo- some of you may, that, that they don't do a lot of talking. 
And, I, and I've been a person who's used to doing a lot of talking because I have to be uh, in, in the pulpit on a weekly basis. But God's just stirring me to just shut up more and to listen and to pay attention, to open my heart and, and to be able to just, to just give him specifically some time because oftentimes when we go into a quiet time, if we set aside that time, but as we go into a quiet time, the first thing that we do is we want to we wanna tell God. We want to say things to God. We want to talk about our situation. We want to tell him what we want. We want to tell him where we want to be. We want to tell him what we want to feel. But even there, I think there's wisdom in actually wanting to talk to God about maybe what he wants to talk to you about. <laughs> did, you get, did you get that for just a second? There's, there's some wisdom rather than you doing all the talking, but to listen. Hey God, I love you. I'm so excited that you're my father, that you care about me. What do you want to talk about today? And just, just listen. And, and God will, he'll, he'll bring some things up. He'll, he'll shine the spotlight. Trust me. He'll, he'll, he'll start to, to stir. And as one person said, you know, we don't want to just be doing things and ask God to bless them. We want to be seeing what God is doing and get in on the blessing because that's where he's at. And how many of you know there, there would be refreshing for us to just time out? Let's, let's move on here real quickly so we can go over a few passages that talk about this. Proverbs ten nineteen. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips... Or wise. Now this isn't this isn't spiritual, you know, haze here. Guess what? Sometimes you might just have to do that. Sometimes you just might have to lock them down when you are a person who maybe quickly responds, or you know, I mean, over the years you can get more and more just snippy. Husbands and wives, you can just get snippy. Why did you do that? And and I believe that you know they make those large binder clips that would just fasten right to your lips, and I bet that there would be, just be some blessing that would come as a result of that, right? Proverbs 17, 27 says, he who has knowledge, he spares his words. And a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Proverbs 17, 28, in the uh, English Standard Version, it says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. I always had this little phrase in my mind, it's better to be silent and considered a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? And there's, there's times. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a situation, I was, I was watching something um, online about, it was called Lie, Lie Witness or something like that, and one of, the, one of the late night talk shows or something like that, like Jimmy Kimmel or whoever, and, and they were interviewing people, and they were literally asking these people like, hey, Listen, what do you think about that new movie, you know, Black and White Piano on the Dance Floor with Eddie Murphy, which never existed, and, and, and what do you think about that? And, and, and people were just lying. They were just like, oh, I think, it was, I think it was really good. I think it was great. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. And they were like, oh, really? Well, tell us about that. Like, what, what exactly about it did you really like? I just think he did a great character portrayal. I mean, this movie didn't exist. They never saw it, and they were just making stuff up. And I wish it was one person, but there's like 25 people. <laughs> what possesses us to, to try to speak against things that we don't know anything about? Do you ever get tempted to do that? Do you ever just lie? Of course you don't. Amen. From <laughs> I didn't say this, but the Bible says that you're a fool. And sometimes you just need to let yourself know that, fool. What am I saying? I, I've done it before. I have. I just, I, I wish I had, somebody had preached this message to me, but nobody did. No, I'm just joking. And, and I've, there's been times when that's happened. But the Bible says, just this year, zzz, zip it. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. Now, those of us know, we, we get into conversation, and before, uh, I mean, before that person's even finished, you're already ready to go with what you're going to say, right? The Bible says that we're being, we're being foolish. 
that if you want a deeper relationship with another person, I'll just say this. I, I know this to be true. Listen. <laughs> Listen. Pay attention. If you want your marriage to be better, listen. If you want uh, your, your, your any area, relationships with your parents to be better, your kids, listen. Take a listen and be slow to speak. So that's T. I'm out. Number two, reflect. Before you just jump in, I mean, you've got people who who will think before they talk. There's people who think while they talk, and there's people who think after they talk. Uh, I'm sure you've never been one of those people who are like, why did I say that? (laughs) Have you ever done that? Why did I say that? What am I doing? Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That there is a, There is a place that you and I can get to prior to that we can ponder and we can can stop for just a second and we can look at and we can be able to understand uh, what we're going to say and how we're going to respond. You know, when I was was, uh, younger and I was growing and understanding like this environment, church, I mean, I came out of playing sports and just hanging with the fellas to the boys to all of a sudden getting into a new environment. And something that just really uh, spoke to my heart early on was because I remember being a ball player and I remember preparing myself. I remember practices and going out and preparing. And someone had talked about like preparation in church, that God wants to do, to do things that are unique and he wants to supernaturally move. And, and that could sound weird or wooey, but just meaning that God like knows you and like when we come into this environment, he wants to speak something real and fresh because he knows where you live. And so what, what, what this person said was, you know, you should always come to, to a service where people gather with something in your heart ready. Just always something ready. You know, and like don't, don't just come because there's two things that happen. Like as you sit there, the responsibility, I'm sure you came this morning and were like, Boy, if Brad doesn't preach a good message, you know, we're going to check out about 12 other churches. And that's fine. That's fine. But the Bible tells you to, to take heed as you hear. That, that you come and you actually make a demand, in a sense. Like, if you come expecting something, that's why, like, you know, it helps. I'm sure Steve would admit to this. Uh, in worship, when you guys come and you're excited. I know you, maybe you got after it last night. I don't know to what extent, but whatever and, and, and maybe you, you've been to a place that was exciting, but how many of you know that here, as we celebrate what God's doing in his love, we can also be excited? And there's, a, there's part of a responsibility for us if we want to receive more, for us to come ready. Are you with me? Yeah, that, didn't, that didn't hurt, did it? <laughs> no. So we come with expectation. The other side that happens too is that from time to time, we just, might, we just might find ourselves in a position where I'm like, hey, listen, could you just take this thing? Because I, I, I just feel like you have something to say. Or you come in and, and you begin to just, you stir your heart and all of a sudden somebody that you're talking to, that thing that was on your heart is for them. Because you're not being a selfish person. You're like, God, man, I just, I love you. I know that you care about people. Or it could be after you go out to eat where you're like, hey, you're cool. I just think you're, you're nice and I just wanted you to know that you're cool and awesome and here's a tip. And, and God, that could be very impactful for somebody. You with me? Because God wants to drop blessings through you. And the only way that that can happen is when you're filled up with something to say. And if you're filled up from last night's craziness, <laughs> then what you have is like blah. Not quite as exciting as something to encourage somebody with. All right, you with me? So our hearts to putting God first and our heart in, in wisdom is, to, is to, to, to reflect. Reflect for just a second. You know, I mean, you could even just right now be like, oh, you know, who do you want to bless through me today? Who do you want to encourage how can, I, how can I say something to somebody that I've been thinking about and I just want to say, hey, you're, you're a cool person. You know, I thought, I thought about you the other day and here's what I wanted to say to you. 
How many of you know that God wants to do that? How many of you would be like, that would be cool if somebody did that to me? Because I would appreciate it. Because I liked it when they said that about my four-year-old son, that he was awesome this. So you could tell me that, okay? I handed you one. Three. Time out, reflect, and number three is ask. Isaiah. I'm going to jump to Isaiah here. L- listen to this whole passage right now. It was in the year uh, King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, this is in heaven, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their, vo- their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. That's weird that tongs is in the Bible. I'm sorry. I just, he touched my lips with it and he said, see this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Ask God to just to, to touch your mouth and not, I don't, this isn't strange, but Psalms uh, 141.3 says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So we can say in training our tongue, God, watch over my mouth. Let me speak words of life. Let me speak words of life over my job and the people that I work with. Let me speak words of life over my church and my spouse. Because we spend a lot of our times frustrated over situations and and death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so we, on a consistent basis, how many of you, our our lives begin to, to have the framework of our words and those words are constantly something negative or frustrations. It isn't meant for us to feel guilty, but for us to set guard over our mouth that we would go, God, Those little rascals that are my children, they're beautiful. I love them. (laughs) Oh, boy. It's for for the parents. Because sometimes we're like, hmm. But God's given us the opportunity to just speak words of life and to ask him, God, help me to watch what I say. Number four, impart. Okay, this is a, a, a good word. Impart, which means to announce or to communicate or to convey or to transmit impart the word of God to your lips. Get, get it in your understanding. We, we've all grown up where we, where we did, you know, some sort of Bible memory, recite and memorize, but there's a reason for it because those words that, are, are, that we find, their life, their life over our situations, over our families, over our spouses, God says, I want not just the information, but I want it to be imparted to you. I mean, think about an impartation of God's love. Uh, You being able to communicate to your heart that God values you. Not, well, that's great. You know, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so, blah, blah, blah. But what if when you began to sit down with a passage of Scripture and you said, God loves me, and you began to reflect on that, and, and as I have over the years, there's been moments where God gives me kind of like a, a, it opens up, right? I mean, there's been times where Zephaniah talks about that God sings over you with his praises, and, and I've spent my life singing to him. And, and one time we were sitting in, in, in a group of, uh, it was a youth pastor at the time, our young, adult, or our young adults that were leaders, and God didn't, it wasn't like I thought this would be cool. I didn't hear it at some meeting. I didn't watch it. But God just said, I want you to change the words to that song because we were singing, Lord, I'm so in love with you. And he said, I want you to change the words to that, Brad. I want you to change it to I'm, you know, Lord, you're so in love with me. And I, and I will tell you, that was an impartation. That announced and communicated something to my heart. And I was like, what just happened? And there was a whole group of us that we needed that. Like we needed to take a shower you know, and just be kind of renewed. We needed to hear that. And God did that in a way that was pretty cool because all of a sudden we're like, what? God loves me? Wow, he sings over me this morning as I'm sitting here because I thought I was doing a whole bunch of cool stuff for him and I was being for him 
And, and it took me to a dimension of understanding that God likes me. I didn't even like myself at the time, I don't think, as much. Now I like myself a lot more because I know that God likes me. I'm just messing with you. So, time out, reflect, ask, impart. Number five is a new language. A new language. How do we train our tongue? Well, the, the Bible gives us transformative vocabulary. It gives us things for us to be able to fixate on it. It, it tells us who we are in Christ. You know, I, I, uh, I, I posted something to Facebook. Some of you who are my friends on Facebook, <clears throat> I'm so blessed to have you as my friends on Facebook. For some. Uh, but, I, but I wrote something and I used the word foibles and one of our, you know, incredible, awesome men of God who's part of our missionary, missionaries, Tony Simon from Mexico, he commented uh, in a very interesting way. <laughs> He's like, who the heck uses the word foibles? And everybody got behind me. Thank you so much, uh, Betsy, and said, or, he does. He uses, he's used the word many times. But s foibles, I use it. It's mistakes, mess ups. Um, but some people just need, need a new vocabulary. Just, just because, you, you know, you, you've sort of entered in and you just have used certain words. I, I think that God wants to give us and has, through Scripture, a life language. The, the words that are edification, edify, is, is, is to build, uh, exhortation is to encourage and comfort. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible uses as God's supernatural words, like edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now, that's what God does with us. And so he wants us to have a new language. Listen, listen to what Mark Twain said, okay? A powerful agent is the right word. Whenever we come upon one of those intensely right words, the resulting effect is physical, as well as spiritual and electrically prompt. The right words. I mean, if you were to take inventory of, of the words that you've been using, I mean, if you were to like a checkbook register or whatever, if you had thought about with intent, what, what type of words have you been using? What type of words have you spoken over your friendships? What type of words have you spoken over your finances, over your job, over your physical body? I mean, what have you spoken? Ugh. Uh, what have you, what have you, I mean, what words? Take inventory to those words because I believe that God wants to put a new language, right, in you. Some of, some of you, the, those hurts and that past and the pain that comes up on a consistent enough basis is there and real and electrically prompt because of the words that you speak. Because of the words that you sow, that you invest, that you plant, it brings fruit. You know what I'm saying? God says, you know what? I want you to train your tongue. I want you to be able to have a new language. I want you to be able to speak in a different way. Sometimes you go to the thesaurus and you get a big old honking word just so that it can express exactly what it is. Sometimes I feel like that even in worship, that we'll, we'll sing songs. And because, you know, even though it's an amazing, incredible, powerful, filled song, but we've sang it so many times and it's not new to us that we almost have to come up with something. It's funny, uh, Matt, um, Vosberg, who, who is part of the worship team, leads it. He, he did something really funny. We had a, a group of our, our, our uh, leaders and, and, and volunteers, and he made up an award where everybody had made one award, and it was like, you know, it was like, you know, uh, I don't know, just awesome person, you know. But he made up the most incredible uh, vocabulary-filled uh, announcement of declaration for any person who was a, a, a volunteer. And I wish I could remember all the world's words, but all I know, it was like the superstar shimmering light of pure awesomeness, you know, transcended upon heaven, on, you know, earth from the stars above. And I was like, you know, every time he said it, I was like, <laughs> it's awesome, Matt. And he said it for about an hour, didn't he, Kristen? Because it was really long if you were there. Um, but every time he said it, I was like, <laughs> that's great. That, is, that, that Matt, he is just something special. But I think that's, that's what it takes. It takes being new. Sometimes you got to come up with something, which is why, you know, we, we do what we do in our culture. You know, we, I, I mean, a few years ago when you said something was bad, 
I mean, it, that was good. And now I don't even sick. Or what, I, that's probably 10 years ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, guys? There's words that you and I use that convey. What are some words that would help us? And, and, and these aren't just things that, that we could just make up, but to ask God, God, help me to understand what it means to be a new creation. What, what does it mean to be a person who's been made new? God, would you help me? Uh, um, I've, I've heard uh, the word tithes. That's, uh, you know, I'm lost in that one. It means a lot of things that are scary to me, but, but what does it mean to give you the first part of, of finances? What does it mean to give you the first part of my heart, the first part of my day? Maybe, maybe there's some things that I missed, and I'm speaking actually out of my own heart, because there are some things that I'm seeing that I missed, because I was holding on to old language of the past and places I've been. Are you with me? I better be quiet. Sorry. Okay. So, I think that um, God wants to expand our level of choice. He wants us to be able to be on guard. He wants us to understand that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And although we've heard that passage of scripture, I think he wants it to become something new and fresh, something real and vibrant, something shimmery and glittery. <laughs> Sorry, I, was, I just had a, uh, a thought back to uh, the movie Elf. I'm gonna just stop for <laughs> And I think that he wants his relationship to take a, a, a turn this year to where he is first. He's first. Now, I'm going to tell you what, what's going to happen for me because I'm beginning to see this exchange that there is some, some things as, as it pertains to leading and growing my family as, as I begin to have them to see God's heart because I want them to get it. I've always, I think Noel and I, more than anything that we have prayed about for church and what we've done is like, man, God, we, we want five, 10, 15, 20 years. We just want our kids to love you, to like you, like us, like the church. You know, we don't want it to be bad. We want it to just be awesome. And you know, God's been faithful. Our kids love to come to church. Sometimes they want to get here before we do. You know, we're like, guys, just wait. We're tired. Okay, no, no please, let's go. And, and that's really awesome. But there's other things that I want to show them because I believe that God's put it in my heart to, to cast a vision for, for, for the word of God, that it gives life. To, to, to see the vision, to follow after God is the best possible thing. So, so I'm careful. You'll, you'll notice I'm careful in what I say to you. I'm careful in how I present it. I'm careful because I don't want you to walk away ever feeling condemned or guilty. Conviction or encouraged or inspired or like, yeah, I want to I grow. I want to be better. That's okay. But to feel like, oh, Brad just kicked me where it hurts. No. And so I, I, I've struggled for a long time looking at a, a lot of different things, and, and God's been, he's, all along the way, he's been refining my heart and showing me some things. And it wasn't just till recently that it, he started to speak to me along areas of, with our relationship, Noel and mine, with, with the, the first part of the moments of my day, that, that I'm looking at two thir 2013 to give him those first moments. Usually I'll be, I'll wake up and boom, I'm here and I'm there and I'm there, and then eventually I get around, all right, God, let's chat. But he wants, he's about aligning our lives in a specific way because when he's first, everything flows right. And, and he got down to, to where I write my check and, my, uh, and, and how I give. And he's like, Brad, you've been generous. He has. He's opened my eyes to his generosity. But he said, I want to be first. Whoa. What do you mean? And he's like, I want you to show your children that the very first part of what comes in, I want you to show them that it goes because it's God's. And I was like, <laughs> God, now you're, now you're making me feel like all those, those people that I saw. He's like, no, Brad, it's relationship. Because when you start to give me the first part, because this is why I asked for it all along the way, seek first the kingdom of God. And he constantly brings it up. It's because it's the place that everything flows and everything is right. Because like I said, and these are the four words that God gave to me even this morning. He said, Brad, when things get in alignment, I start to give assignments. And when I start to give assignments, those assignments come, and then comes refinement, 
And once you start to be refined and you start to get it, then comes fulfillment. And I said, boy, those, those all rhyme and they make up the word arf, arf. That's just how I talk to God. I, I, I bust some jokes on him. But in reality, those were the words that came to me. And he said, Brad, I, I, want, I want you to, to share that because I believe that you have people that are sitting at every, every specific level. There's people who are desiring God's very best. They want their life to be fulfilled. There's people that are, are it's, it's been a difficult struggle. They've been hurt. And, and so as a result of that, they're living out of that past pain. And, and I, and I want to bring things in that proper order because I have some assignments to pass out. And in those assignments doesn't mean that everything gets perfect and easy. Some of you have assignments that God's given to you. But how many of you know that those assignments have brought refinement? And in those refinements, God is coming to, to bring about fulfillment. You with me? Bow your head and close your eyes with me. Heavenly Father, I, I took more time than I normally allot. Would you just bless the words? Would you let them impart to the hearts of every person that's here? Father, would you open our lives up to be able to surrender more of our hearts to you, to surrender places that we've held back because we truly do desire to live with you as the leader of our life. God, we can't make any more excuses because somebody's hurt us, somebody did us wrong, situations that came. We just want to let all that go this morning, Father, and we want to follow you. We want to trust you. We want to live our lives aligned with your very heartbeat, open up our hearts to be able to see the very best of what you have. God, this morning, there are those that are here that maybe even just surrendering their heart to you is a step, a first step, because that's the, the very best of what God asks for. He asks for our heart. Because when he has that, then everything else just sort of falls, falls in line. If you're here this morning, you don't know how valuable you are to God. You have no idea emotionally how valuable you are to God. The fact that God loves you, has pursued you, and chased you. Gave his son for you as a gift because he cares about you. Wants to have a loving relationship with you where he speaks to you, where he he gives to you. If you're here and you've never experienced that, would you lift your hands and say, pray for me this morning? I want to be able to have that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else says, that's me. If you're here this morning on a second request to just say, you know what? It's 2013. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to live in the wisdom of God. I'm ready for understanding. I'm ready for something greater. I'm ready for something more profound. I'm ready to get things in alignment because I'm ready for his assignments. I'm ready for what he has. I'm ready for what he wants to do. And if you'd say, yeah, that's me, would you lift your hand and say, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's pray this prayer together and let's, let's honestly stir in our hearts something. Let's just stir in our hearts an expectation of great things that God has in store for us. Repeat these words with me. Say this. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving and giving and giving. Thank you for your son who died, who rose again, who shed his blood to cover every sin, every mistake, every foible every failure to make me new a new person a new creature something brand new so that I could become a child of God In Jesus name say amen